Well, good morning. Um, if there is a question, I'm going to try to pause at different points, but if you have a question or a comment, feel free to break in. Just unmute yourself and say, hey, Jim, <laughs> and I'll pause. All right, so let's share a prayer together and then we'll get started. Loving God, you are so good. On this Mother's Day, as um, we celebrate all the moms in our lives, um, our biological moms, our our virtual moms, our uh, extended moms, I thank you for the gift of motherhood um, and the ways that our moms so often reflect you. God, I'm reminded when I often ask the question, tell me who's loved you best in your life, how often I hear mom or grandmother. It's, that's, that's so common. So thank you for our moms. And this morning, as we consider a lesson called Seeing Hope, Lord, help us to, in the midst of whatever circumstance we're in, whatever we're facing, whether it's our coronavirus or health issues or moving people, all job circumstances, all the prayer requests we've, we've shared that um, help us to be able to see hope, the hope that is alive in and through you. So Lord, whatever words I speak this morning, may your Holy Spirit translate those words to whatever each person needs to hear. We pray this in and through the name of Christ, for you are our ever-present help, hope, and healing. Amen. Okay, so this morning is, uh, this could be a little different style for me. Um, I think some of you will appreciate this style. It's, it's very heavy walkthrough of scripture, um, which often I'm very topical. But we're going to walk through a passage um, from Philippians chapter 4, and which takes us then also all over Scripture and other places. But seeing hope, perspective from an imprisoned apostle. And I found this image, and I thought that was so good <laughs> um, online about how we can often see things uh, in black and white, see things dull, and how our hope in Christ um, can help us see the sunrise, help us see the sun, S-O-N, rise in, in all our circumstances. And we'll, we'll talk about that with the Apostle Paul uh, and his imprisonment today. One of the videos I was going to show, I realized I showed several weeks ago, and I'll just highlight it here. And that was um, of these people who were putting on these glasses that helped them um, move from color blindness and see full color and the power that that is, and the power that um, seeing with a new perspective can do. So that's what we're going to do today. I uh, found this quote from Star Charles Spurgeon, and uh, he said, Faith goes up the stairs that love has built and looks out the windows which hope has opened. Loved that. Loved that. That's kind of a summary of where we're going today. So here's our passage. We're going to read the whole passage, and we're going to be in and out of uh, Scripture. Um, I know uh, some of you are on a, I think most of you are on at least an iPad. Hopefully I've made the text big enough, but of course I will also be reading it. And I think if you're on an iPad or an iPhone, there is a picture down the right-hand side, one or more. I hope those do, don't get in the way. I haven't found a way to get rid of them on iPads or iPhones, but I have, you can, if you're on a laptop, you can click on it and minimize it and get rid of it that way. So here is our scripture for today. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, 
but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. Hold on one sec. My screen just did something really strange. Well, that's weird. Okay. So seeing hope, and I now have uh, something weird on my screen, but that's all right. <laughs> hey, Jim, I figured, I figured out when the text comes up how to minimize the picture. We tap on the bottom of the screen on your iPhone. Yes, yeah. The picture that will come up, you just tap on that. Okay, great. And so just the text. Good deal. I'm going to pause something because there's a scratch that's on my screen. I don't think it's on my screen. Let me stop share. Yeah, it's not there. Let me share again and see if it's back. Hold on. Here we go. Thank you. Hey, it's gone. Suddenly I thought my screen was cracked. <laughs> okay. So um, where I want to begin with this is kind of doing some uh, history of Philippians. So Philippians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul from prison. So it's written from prison. There's some different um, perspectives on where that prison was, whether it was when he was in Rome or whether it was on house arrest. But uh, regardless, uh, it was a letter written from prison. So that shapes how we read this. So here's how we know that. In, in the first chapter, right after he's greeted everyone, he said, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has already served to advance the gospel. And as a result, it has become clear through the whole palace guard and to everyone else, I'm in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. And someone's not muted, that I'm getting some background noise. It might be you, Christy. If you could just pause and mute for a minute, that'd be great. Thanks for that uh, help. So we know Paul wrote the letter from prison, and he had several reasons for writing this letter. The first, we also get in chapter one, was to thank the Philippians. And I love this part of the passage. Um, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. From the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. Whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And I, I often have put this in an email to someone in ministry um, that I partner with and feel a partner with across the world. Um, and it, it's just a beautiful uh, Thanksgiving passage from Paul that he opens this letter with. The other thing that I love about it is that he's not only um, saying thank you, but he's encouraging them to have hope already and see with different eyes. He's already doing that in this, in his example. He's exemplifying it as he's writing from prison. He's sharing that, but there's also this um, way that he is just exemplifying the, the hope that he has and that he's going to be sharing in words here. And here's some examples of how he's doing that. That he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. And what I loved about that and why I underlined until is it because uh, we'll carry it on to completion not at the day of Jesus Christ, but until the hope exists now. The hope exists now, and I, and I love that. Um, and he's able to say that in the circumstances he's saying it. It reminded me of a, another uh, book that he wrote and a, a very known passage from Romans 8.28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Um, one of the things with that is a lot of people want to say, you know, everything happens for a reason, things like that. We could have a whole lesson on that. 
And I don't know that I'm, I'm I think that's a half truth <laughs> because I don't think God causes all things, but no matter what circumstance we face in all things, God works for good. All right. So Paul wrote the letter from prison. He wrote it for several reasons to thank the Philippians, to encourage them to stand firm. So a little bit later in the first chapter, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Here's one of the things I love about how he words that there. He's not saying just, all right, now stand firm. You can do this. He's not just cheerleading. He's affirming and cheerleading something that he's already seeing in them. And that is often comes across so much differently than just saying, okay, you can do this. It's like, all right, I know you got this in you. I've seen it before. You're doing it. Now let's do it more. And that is a powerful encouragement um, to be able to not only just urge them to it, but encourage the way he's already seeing it in them. And herein begins our focus on hope and seeing circumstances from a, a different perspective. Okay? So stand firm. Let's have hope. We can see this differently. And finally, um, he also had this reason to exhort them to humility and unity. So he says in uh, Philippians chapter 2, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. I'm going to pause here for a minute because hope has to do with this. Hope has to do with our perspective of, of ourselves, our perspective of how God is holding on to us. And again, he's commenting on what he's kind of seeing. So if you have this encouragement, and I, I see many of you do from what we read a minute ago, if comfort from God, then make my joy complete. So it's not just pulling this out of nowhere. It's from how Christ is already working in you. And keep going. Have that same love. And then he moves on to saying, and this is the love that lives in you. In Christ Jesus, one of my favorite, favorite passages, this description of Jesus' work. Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to glory of God the Father. There is this, just all these paradoxes through scripture, but this paradox, but that as we humble ourselves and we trust the one in us, we trust the one who's made us, but we do that in this humble way, then we find this greater peace. That is when um, we can experience hope in a different way. There's a link between hope and humility, and it's a mindset of how we walk. When we walk with hope in Christ, humility follows. When we humble ourselves and trust Christ at work in, around, and through us, hope follows. And hope and humility lead to unity. Hope and humility lead to unity. And unity is a key quality of God's kingdom. This is from uh, the Gospel of John, and this is Jesus praying in the garden. And I love this passage, too, because he's, he's prayed for himself, then he prayed for his disciples, and then he prays for us. But look at what he says here about um, unity. And this is in the context of, of humility because he's going to the cross in this moment. So he said, my prayer is not for them alone, the disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. <laughs> and all of that all of them may be one. 
Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, and he says this twice, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I and them, you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. And again, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as I have loved you. And you have loved me. Here's something on my screen again, again. I will clear that out in a minute. But when we find that unity, that humility, hope comes, and um, then the world knows. That's a witness to the world. That's God's kingdom unfolding. I love that. I love that. I love that. Okay. So we are going to go back to our passage. That sets up what Paul is doing in, um, in the uh, lesson today. I keep seeing these things on my screen, which is okay. That sets up what is happening in our lesson. But let's get... Uh, back to it where we began today. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident in all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which trans all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So I want to share something here. I'm going to stop and come back to get this little, oh, there it went. I'm getting these lines on my uh, computer here for some reason, which is okay. All right. So I want to share a couple stories. Um, the first is this. I'm trusting many of you have seen or know the um, uh, story of the movies Back to the Future. And in Back to the Future, one of the things when he went to the future, he realized that the Cubs won, not the year they actually won. It was the year before they actually won. But in the movie, uh, he went ahead and found that out. I want you to imagine that you were on a team that got secret knowledge that your team won the championship. How would that approach the way, or how would that change the way you approach the season? If you knew that you won the championship at the end, but then you started struggling mid-season, man, you had a losing streak, how would it change the way you walk through that losing streak, play through that losing streak, if you knew that you already won? Knowing our hope changes the way we think and the way we live. And I just love that illustration because we know our hope in Christ. That not only do we win in the end, and love wins in the end, but as Paul exemplifies, as Christ exemplifies, there is a way to claim that victory in the moment, no matter what we face. Another illustration, you may have heard me share this one before. So this kid is playing uh, baseball in his yard, and uh, he does this where he's pitching to himself, and he, he says, I'm the greatest hitter in the world! And he throws the ball up, and he swings and he misses. Okay, gets his perspective together again, says it again. I'm the greatest hitter in the world. Throws the ball up, swings, and he misses. <sighs> Deep breath. He can do this. He's not struck out yet. I'm the greatest hitter in the world. <laughs> He's going to do it this time. Throws the ball up, he swings, and he misses. I'm the greatest pitcher in the world, he says. Perspective can change it. When we can see things with a different lens, it can change how we go through things. And just as another little comic relief here, I, I do want to share it with you. I found this picture just trying to get a, a, a boy throwing up a, a ball to pitch to himself, but you'll be a little surprised what it actually is. Here we go. Three baseball trick shots. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was my little uh, comic relief there. <laughs> okay, so this is a common theme in Paul's letters because it's vital to our life, our faith, and witness um, to not be anxious, to offer prayer, to have hope, and to try to live into that. And he says it again this way where he says, therefore, 
And this is in uh, 2 Corinthians, by the way. So another letter. This fills all his letters, this hope. So we don't lose heart, he says. But though we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and our momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So this is a key to be able to, to see hope, to see beyond what we're seeing in the moment, to look with different eyes. But I know that that doesn't come naturally um, at all. <laughs> and that's why, for me, the first step of prayer is always to recognize to recognize. Think back to the ways God has worked in our lives so that we can better see and remember them when things get tough. This is why we do praises um, in our uh, prayer request time, to, to look back and go, oh, that was you, God. Thank you for that. This is why Malia does God sightings, because the more we do that, the more we train our heart, our mind, our eyes, our ears to be able to see how God is at work in every moment. The other night, I was um, uh, asked to give a little presentation for the leadership at St. John United Methodist Church of our Belong series that we've done. If you can see my camera, if you remember this, they are looking at using that um, this coming fall. And uh, it was really an honor to, to have them do that. But here's, we started this meeting where they said, you know, we got to get right into it. But Jim, we always start our meetings with glory sightings. And each of them went around and they shared, just like Malia does with God sightings, ways that they had seen God in the uh, previous days. That is so important to train our eyes, our ears, our heart, to see beyond the temporary. So the more we can do that, then I believe we get better in the moment. So thinking back gives us hope in the moment. We recognize, oh, that was you, God. Okay, help me hold on to that for the future. So Paul has this theme throughout many of the things he does, as I've kind of shared through his books. There's another book, the book of Hebrews, which not 100% that it was written by Paul, but we think it was written by Paul. And he has this whole chapter, chapter 11 in Hebrews, which starts this way. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So again, that, that idea of how do we begin to name things and see things beyond what we're just seeing in front of us, because that's temporal. So how do we start to have spiritual eyes? And he spends this whole chapter then after this doing things like this. And I didn't list all of them, but imagine 10 or 12 of these. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain's. By faith, Noah built an ark to save his household. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called. So um, the writer of Hebrews, probably Paul, is naming these God sightings, these glory sightings, and how those things are living out in people. Not just the way God works, but how others are living into the way God works. And so that's a really uh, important way. And he says this then, after he, he lists a bunch of them, he says, each of one of these people, of faith died not yet having in hand what was promised. It wasn't in its fullness yet, but still believing. How did they do it? They saw it off in the distance, waved their greeting. I love that phrase. <laughs> All right, I'm coming. I know we win the World Series. All right, we're not there yet, but I know we win it. I'm, I'm claiming it. And accepted the fact that they were transients in the world, that this is a process. People who live this way make it plain that they are looking for their true home. Their true home. I wrote a post just a minute ago for Bindi on Mother's Day um, that she makes her house a home. And so often we live in, in houses, and I'm not just talking about the physical structures, but when we live in this world, we live in houses. We see the world that way. But we can understand what we experience in the world as home when we see it through the hope of Christ 
in and through all that we faced and the way that Christ walked through his challenges to all the way through death and the cross and the way Paul is doing this from prison as well. That can bring hope to all of our challenges. So in this meeting with, um, let me get this page off, with, this, with St. John the other day, one of the things the pastor said that I really, really liked, oh, there was a, I missed something, hold on. Bye, James. Um, one of the things I really liked was he talked about a spirit of abundance, having a spirit of abundance. And, and I love that. He said, have a spirit of abundance versus a spirit of scarcity. Now, when we think about a spirit of abundance, some people may think, well, that means things, okay? But abundance is so much more than things. A spirit of abundance is, this, is what comes with the fruits of the spirit. Our abundance in God brings us love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's not so much about things. It's about these qualities that live in us. And when we live from a spirit of abundance instead of a spirit of scarcity, then um, we have hope. I'm getting a phone call. Let me decline that. Boom. <laughs> Lots of little distractions today. Scarcity can lead to selfishness and protection and uh, self-protection, defensiveness, Part of that we're seeing in our world right now. Um, we know that gun sales are up. We know that people are we're hoarding toilet paper. That's a spirit of scarcity, okay? But when we have a spirit of abundance, we trust something deeper. We have eyes that are seeing something deeper. And we, we live beyond fear, as we talked about a few weeks ago. Okay. Let me come back up. I'm trying to walk a few different things here. So, as I said a minute ago, this isn't easy, okay? It's not easy. Our lives are so full of ups and downs, it can take its toll on our spiritual life, our ability to trust and see. I know I struggle with it here. I'm maybe sounding like I got this all together, but those of you who know me well know that many days I don't. One day we feel good because life is good and we're feeling close to God because life is good, and the next we're feeling like the world is caving in and God is against us. Um, and it's interesting how our circumstances can make us feel differently about God's presence with us when God is with us in all places. But that happens. I'm going to tell a story about that in a minute. But in my opinion, uh, this is one of the biggest strategies of the enemy, trying to convince us that our hope is not true. After all, as we spoke of several weeks ago, Satan is the father of lies, okay? So I want to go back to the baseball example for just a minute. What if your team, and I hinted at this, who you already know is will win the championship, suddenly was in a losing streak and they were giving up? Wouldn't that be a tragedy? That if, you know, they knew that they won, but then they saw this losing streak in the middle of the season and they gave up? You know, God gives us a freedom, so we know we win, but um, he gives us the freedom to choose to live into that or not. Be a tragedy to give up. And so we need to claim that hope from the future into the now, into the now. Um, a story, I thought I had it later here, but um, I was doing a crisis response this last uh, Friday that I got called in for as a chaplain. And this person had been affected by the tornadoes, um, some other things, had a, a breakup with a fiance as a result of everything. Just a ton of circumstances. My heart broke for this person. But this person kept saying to me, um, he wanted to be a person of faith, and I believe he is. He's like, I want to do what God wants, but I can't figure out what God is testing me about. I can't figure out, you know, I know God wants me to learn something and he's doing this for a reason. And we, we let those things slip into so much. So in that, and, and I gently tried to guide him, he was saying that he felt like the tornadoes, the breakup, all these circumstances, God had um, some plan in that so that he could learn a lesson. <laughs> and I asked him, I said, if you had a member of your family who struggled with addiction, and you were hoping that they would grow through that, 
would you send them to uh, the place where that addiction really lives out? If they were an alcoholic, would you say, all right, go into that alcohol shop? You know, I don't think that's the way God works. He said, no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> we grow in other ways. So he was basing his circumstances on God's impression of him instead of just trusting that those circumstances are part of what we face. But God is with him to bring hope and goodness in those things. As hard as it is, God is with him and walking through it and redeems all of our circumstances. Um, and so it's a challenge sometimes when we think if things are going wrong, God must be against us. If things are going right, God must be for us. God is always for us. Always, always, always for us. If God is for us, who can be against us is another passage. All right. Let me figure out, I went off script there for a minute. Let me figure out where I am. <laughs> oh, I know where I was. Thank you. <laughs> I went off script. Um, we can't do this alone. We can't do this alone. So those of you who know me well know that, you know, there's many days I struggle with this kind of stuff. And I'm not seeing. I can talk about it now when things are okay, but I'm not seeing. And we've got to be in this together. And I think that's part of why Paul and Jesus were talking about the oneness of the community of Christ, that we've got to do it together. And this is what has been such a powerful thing for me. I've become thankful for people who remember and remind me of what's true when I forget and stop living into it, when that baseball team is in that losing moment, someone can say, remember, this, you, you got this. It's a win. This is just a, a, a hump in the road. You can get through this. And I'm so thankful for some people, some of you are them, who remind me what's true when I forget and stop living into it. And that's where Paul goes in Philippians here. And he says, Brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, admirable, anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think on such things. And that can be hard to do at times. But we're encouraged to do it here by Paul, and then we're encouraged to help each other do it. He's doing it for the Philippians in that moment from prison. And um, thinking on such things, that's where it begins. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, then put it into practice. So it begins with our thinking. Like I shared with the story with this gentleman, his thinking, of course he was thinking things. I mean, with the circumstances he'd faced, he was in this pit. So his thinking was a little bit mixed. Hopefully I was able to help him with that. So we change our thinking as we did here, and then we step into it. So then when your thinking has changed, what you've learned or received or heard from or seen from me, then put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. This goes back to the lesson a few weeks ago of love beyond fear. This is the beyond part. Put it into practice. Okay, let's lean into love and, and walk with it through um, the circumstances we face and the peace of God will be with you. And that's why Paul can say, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. So I want to share a story that I came across. It's a story about uh, a farmer and some horses. And um, the story comes out of the Middle East, uh, or the Eastern, China area. That's not Middle East, that's East. Um, and I'm just going to read this to you. A farmer had an old horse that he used for tilling his fields. One day, the horse escaped into the hills. And when all the farmer's neighbors heard about it, they sympathized with the old man over his bad luck. Bad luck? Good luck? Who knows? Said the farmer. A week later, the horse returned with a herd of wild horses from the hills, and this time the neighbors congratulated the farmer on his good luck. And again, he said, good luck, bad luck, who knows, said the farmer. Then when the farmer's son was attempting to tame one of the wild horses, he fell off his back and broke his leg. 
Everyone agreed that this was very bad luck. Not the farmer who replied, bad luck, good luck, who knows? Some weeks later, the army marched into the village and forced every able-bodied young man to fight in a bloody war. When they saw the farmer's son had a broken leg, they let him stay. Everyone was very happy at the farmer's good luck. And again he said, good luck, bad luck, who knows? So often we get trapped by defining our circumstances um, in a way that kind of pits it against ourselves. And what the Apostle Paul is saying about whatever the circumstances, he's choosing not to see the circumstance as some indication from God, but instead trust that God is with him in those circumstances and that with different eyes, he can see hope and that can change thinking and that can change how we then live it as well. So life is a lot like this. Sometimes it seems like things are going well and other times it seems they're going badly. And too often we let those dictate our feelings and our outlook on life. When things are going well, we're happy and we think God is with us. If they're going badly, we get discouraged and think that God must have abandoned us. We end up tossing, being tossed around in our circumstances, tossed by the waves. But the Apostle Paul reminds us what it means to be content, even happy, joyful in all circumstances. He was happy when things were bad from jail. And he was happy when things were going well. That's the great thing about being part of God's family. We really don't have to worry in our circumstance because no matter what, we have hope in Christ. And then it goes this, the famous last verse that has been quoted and quoted, but everything today sets up this verse. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Christ who faced, became human to face all that we face and go all the way through death because he knew the hope of God the Father and the hope of redemption, the hope of eternal life that not only begins when we die, but begins now. All right. That's my lesson. <laughs> um, any thoughts? Any thoughts? Any thoughts? I didn't pause on that to do any thoughts. Raise your hand. Karen, are you about to hit unmute? <laughs> uh, Chris, uh, Christy. <laughs> Let me go to Christy really quick, Karen. She was raising her hand. I'll come right back to you. Go ahead, Christy. I guess, well, he's talking about his hope even in my current situation. Like, there's so many jobs becoming available right now that hopefully I could apply and just go ahead and get one today. <laughs> so, Christy, are you saying that that was helpful for you today to know yes. that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, Yes, because you're experiencing that right now. Thank you, Christy. Karen? Well, I think, um, you know, so many of us use the verse, like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me as, like, this, like, super victorious, like, everything's going to go okay verse. And I love that, like, when you see all the background, it's not, a, like, prideful verse. It's really, like, the greatest verse of humility, like that it's Christ that does it. It's my contentment in darkness. It's my focus on, you know, joy and hope and peace and all these like good things that, you know, through that strength, you know, we can do all things. It's not, I don't know. I just think, I think in that circumstance and with that background, it's really helpful. Um, and then the other thing I was going to share um, some of y'all know I'm married to a Honduran, um, and a few of you might know some of the, like, visa applications and uh, all kinds of other things we've gone through um, through immigration, but um, your story about the farmer and the horses just really made me think about my husband's perspective when we started talking about applying for his first visa, because he would tell me, well, if I get it, praise God. I was like, yeah, if you get it, praise God. And then he'd say, if I don't get it, praise God. And I was like, what? You're crazy. No, like if you get it, praise God. If you don't get it, we need to pray more or something like that. And, um, but really actually then he said that statement and then Honduras, um, 
the United States like revoked all Honduran visas for about six months. And he was still like, oh, it's okay, praise God. And then they opened them back up and then he applied and then he got one. You know, it was just, um, but just that attitude that really was truly like good things, praise God, bad things, praise God. Like it's all, it's all the same. Um, I just, yeah, the good and bad with a perspective, you know, Uh that's so good. And Karen, the first thing you said about that last verse, you summed that up better than I did. I mean, so good. Thank you. You could have taught today. (laughs) (laughs) My other memory with that verse is actually packing bags with my sister when we were going to take a trip to Honduras and they all have to be, you know, 50 pounds to fly on Delta and um, I went to weigh one and I said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But then I couldn't lift it up. It was like 80 pounds and, and we had to do everything. But um, again, just like the humbling reminder of, you know, God walks with us. Through yeah. the, we can't pick up and through the things that, that are easily carried. <laughs> uh, great. Thank you so much, Karen. What a joy. I see lots of laughter and, and uh, nods as you're sharing. All right, other thoughts? Anyone? Looking. Yes, Tom. I've unmuted. No, you, you have to unmute yourself, Tom. Uh, there you go. It's the wrong spot. So this is a more open-ended, but a lot of the Old Testament view seems to be you're either on God's good side or bad side conditionally upon what you or collectively the the Jewish people were doing. I'm just curious what quick comment you would make about that. You know, I've been doing a lot of study on that, and uh, I'm not saying I have it right, but here's my perspective. This comes from uh, uh, Bible professor Peter Enns, and God lets people tell their story. And how much of that was actually the words of God or people's perspective of what God was doing. So that's the simple answer. Um, Some people disagree with me on that, and I'm not an Old Testament scholar, but um, I do wonder if sometimes that was just how people told the story versus that was actually. Because when we see Jesus, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. When you see me, you saw the Father. We uh, shared some of that passage tonight. I don't think any of us could ever imagine Jesus doing some of the things that we say God does in the Old Testament. But if Jesus and God are the same, then we have to look at the Old Testament through the character of Jesus. So that's my short answer for that. (laughs) That's that's helpful. I, I can go with that. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? That was a good question. Woo. (laughs) Anyone else? Is that the rights trying to do something? Yes. Yes. Let me unmute it. Go ahead, Billy and Lewis. I was just going to say that the lesson was really meaningful to me because it it touched on so many scriptures that I go to for strength. And, you know, you just have to have those. It's so important for us and it's important for our children and grandchildren to have verses that they can go to when they're feeling discouraged or down or, you know, they just, their faith is being tested. I really agree with that. And that's that it starts in the head, right? I mean, it can't just stay in the head, but it starts in the head. It starts with their way of thinking. I shared two or three weeks ago about my struggle with depression and how my uh, psychiatrist, Dr. Jennings said, Jim, do you know a lot of it is your understanding of God and that you have this subtle way of seeing God against you. You see God for everyone else, but you have this subtle way. He said, we've got to change your thinking. And from there, other things will start to change. Well, I can't say who who said this, but I remember something I read um, years ago that said, are you satisfied to know God in your head or do you want to know him fully in your heart? And that's been really meaningful too, because it's all about your heart. Yeah not you have Christ in your life. Yeah. You just, and I I won't be able to find it quick, but there's a C.S. Lewis quote that's really famous. In fact, it was in my notes for today and somehow it didn't make it in. But 
that so often as God's children, see if I can get this, we are satisfied um, making mud pies in the sand lots of the slums when a, a holiday at sea is what's promised us, that we get satisfied with these other things. But it's all on perspective, isn't it? I totally misquoted that, but hopefully you could go look at it. You want it. Anyone else? Hello, Sammy. It's good to actually see you this week. <laughs> good to see you. Anyone else? All right. How about as we close in prayer, worship starts here in a few minutes. As we close in prayer, any further prayer requests that weren't shared at the beginning? All right. Let me ask this. I haven't asked this before. Um, when I ask this in my Sunday school class, I get everyone looking down. <laughs> but is there anyone who'd like to close in prayer for us? I've done 90% of the talking today. Uh, I love hearing you all. Anyone like to do that? <laughs> it's okay if you wouldn't. I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm looking. All right, Mike. Awesome, Mike. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> Mike, Mike Roberts is going to, I think that's what you were volunteering for, right? Yes, I'll be glad to. Thank you so much, Mike. Close up in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you for this time we've got to share together. Not always in the way we usually think about it, but we've come together and we've studied your word together and we've learned together. Now, Father, as we leave this place, Lifting up those prayer requests we had, remembering those that are struggling through this time we have. Let those words that we studied remain in our hearts and in our minds to lift us up and carry us through these times, that we may be strengthened by your strength, that we may be lifted up by our hope in you father we just thank you for our teacher and our class and all this that gets us through everything you've given us